Hi, this is your host Swapan Bhartia and today we have with us Eric Semmer, founder and CEO of Decodable. Eric, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, this is the first time I'm talking to you, so I, I am curious about the company. So tell us a bit about uh, what was the kind of origin story of this company. Decodable was a little over a year and a half old and, you know, the 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 thing that sort of brought me here, um, it's my second, it's my second startup, but I've spent the last 12 or so years working in uh, core data infrastructure and, and increasingly more real-time systems. Think Apache Kafka, Pulsar, those, you know, Kinesis, those kinds of things, and now stream processing. And, you know, over and over and over again, we see, um, you know, our, our belief, my belief was that Stream processing in general is kind of where uh, Hadoop was in 2010. It's a bunch of small piece part systems that is left to, you know, users to assemble into a platform. And we, you know, we've watched people over and over and over again struggle with the complexity of it. You know, how do they build these jobs? How do they run these jobs? How do they manage these jobs? And more and more of these use cases are going real time you know, logistics, retail, those kinds of things. And so for me, it was just really obvious that this felt like the right time because the use cases are there. And the technology, I think, is is at a place where it can be made to be accessible to mere mortals. And like, that's that's really our goal, fundamentally. I'm also curious, I mean, I talked to a lot of companies who do work in this space, but how widely used uh, is real-time analytics? Real-time data, is streaming data, uh, is it specific to certain industries or use cases, or it is kind of becoming, you know, default? Um, I do think, still think it's early, right? I would not sort of say that it's it's mainstream just yet. I think it's happening in in pieces. So when we think about stream processing as maybe distinct from like streaming analytics, we are not talking about Bloomberg terminals that tick in real time. Right. Like I, I actually think that that's in a lot of ways the least interesting portion of real time. What is happening and what's driving this is two things. One, uh, data processing for ingest and analytics, ad hoc analytics is going real time because companies have at this point realized that they can get they can train their models on better data that is more accurate because it's more recent. Right. It's fresher. So it's not so much that it's real time. It's that it's um, fresh the freshest data humanly possible. I think the other thing that's driving the, the sort of more mainline adoption here is that increasingly it is not a human that's at the end of the analytics. It's actually a microservice that's making decisions in real time. So like product recommendations is a really obvious example where it's not that there's a human looking at a dashboard and then like reprioritizing what products get displayed on a website. It's a machine, it's a model. And I think that, is driving what I think over the next five years will become mainstream, will become sort of primary mainstream adoption. But Kafka and the streaming systems are there. The processing is now just getting caught up. We, we like to think we're a part of that, but, you know, at, at Decodable for sure. But, um, but I, think that, I think that's the, the thing that's leading to this. How mature is the market for, you know, real-time analytics, streaming data, solutions and tools? Uh, let's talk about the technology part, and then we can also talk about the skill part, which actually is even more challenging, especially if you look at the data scientists and data engineers, they are even short of supply. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the technology and the open source projects, primarily the open source projects around this, like Apache Flink or uh, Confluence, you know, uh, uh, Kafka K-Streams and those kinds of things. I think that they have for large for large part in large part they have solved the like scale and latency portions of the problem the thing that they haven't solved is the ease of use and developer experience portion of the problem and what i would lovingly call like enterprise readiness what does data quality look like in a streaming context versus uh an at rest or batch context what does compliance and auditing look like what does you know, uh, change management or version schema migrations and version updates and those kinds of things look like in a streaming context. So those are the places where I think the technology is probably less mature in general. And that's the place where we spend most of our time, you know, being based on Apache Flink, which which we think is the right open source project under the hood. Um, but there's so much 
that needs to be built on top of that in order to make it operational and, and you know sort of like available for real world use cases for folks. The, the beauty of open source is, uh, as you mentioned, all these open source uh, projects there is that the project is there, you can go in there, you can download the code, you can start using it, you can also, you know, start tweaking it, which also means that you do need folks, you understand not only the, the code as a developer, but they also know it how to use in production. And there's already a skill gap. Number two is that, uh, and that's where like the commercialization of open source comes to play, where companies, they not only, of course, uh, make it enterprise ready, you need updates, you need uh, patches, you need, you know, upgrades. You also need additional features that the wider community may not be interested in. So so talk also about, you know, uh, or we can talk about day two, you know, challenges that comes with that. So let's just stay on that and let's look at from that perspective. Uh, and I, one of the questions that I also asked was the skill gap is there also there. So talk about how folks like, you know, Decodable, they try to kind of solve the problem. And you also talk something about make it easier. And that is the critical piece, you know. So so let's talk about that aspect. I think you're absolutely right about, and like my entire career has been based on open source technology sort of like active in that community. I, I, I like the idea of open source code for a variety of reasons. Um, that said, I think you're actually right. I think the thing that the open source communities are actually really good at are things like scale and like, you know, uh, performance characteristics and like those kinds of things. The place where I think, frankly, the open source community is not always ideal is the singleness of like vision because it is development by committee right so excuse me you don't have a single voice saying like no 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 uh user experience isn't good we're going to reimagine what the user experience looks like or we're going to up level the apis that we sort of give people um instead people are sort of um, empowered to scratch a particular itch. And so what that means is you have these really sophisticated open source projects like Apache Flink and Kafka and Pulsar and all these other kinds of things, which are excellent. They do what they say they do, but they are challenging. You know, the user, the operational experience, the enterprise class features and like all these other kinds of, and, and, and in general, like I said, the, the usability of these products. And so that is where I think commercial companies are incentivized to close that gap, right? They're incentivized to find the right way to make all of those capabilities accessible to a specific persona or a specific kind of user. And so that's that's where we spend our time. To that point, the skill gap for us is, you know, how do I author these jobs is definitely part of the skill gap because streaming is different enough than batch where you can't just like copy and paste your SQL query from Snowflake to even Decodable and have it like just magically work. I think we get close, but not all the way. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff that we need to build around that to help people be able to author those kinds of pipelines or, or, or streaming SQL queries. Um, but I think honestly, the majority of the skill gap is in like the operational characteristics of these things, you know, resource management, quotas and limits and, like I said, change control and, 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 and sort of the care and feeding of these things. And that, again, is a place where, you know, companies like us are sort of deeply incentivized to solve that problem because that's the thing that blocks adoption. It's not that people don't get it. The thing that blocks adoption is the fit and finish, the last 20%. It's always the last 20% you know, of, of capabilities and, and feature functionality. So well said. One more thing with the commercialization, and it's, it's not just, there might be a few uh, examples in most cases when companies do commercialize open source, they also get involved, they also contribute. So it's, it's uh, you folks, what you do is you turn those open source projects into kind of sustainable model through commercialization. Uh, not only you contribute code, a lot of developers are on your payroll as well. So uh, talk a bit about, you did talk about some projects, but talk a bit about what are the projects which are core to Decodable and how do you also engage with the project and those communities? Yeah, I think foremost when when like a vendor like ourselves, like taking my, my Decodable hat off and putting on my open source contributor hat, right? You know, if that makes sense. When I think about this stuff, I think the question is always like, what do you consider to be core IP? And why are you contributing to this project? And the thing, you know, I think the what is core IP question always answers like, what's your value? And the value for Decodable is not that we're like 10 milliseconds faster than a competitor, 
right? Like fundamentally our core value is the ease of use and the developer experience and like the enterprise class features around this stuff. And so when we internally think about this, we think about the robustness of the project, the core functionality of Flink, for instance, and we do contribute to those kinds of things. We have uh, Flink committers and staff and those kinds of things. Um, and there'll be more, you know, I think interesting announcements in the future about, about sort of where we contribute and why. Um, but there, what we're looking for is we want the community to be healthy in terms of like the quality of contributions, the diversity of contributors. We don't want one company who controls an open source project because it's our belief that the project itself benefits from being used in different ways and having different viewpoints of people contributing to it. And so we see it as valuable that like Netflix or Lyft or Uber or whomever Stripe is going to make commitments to the open source community. I mean, yes, we benefit from that, but also the use cases get burned in, the personas, the experience, the production readiness gets burned into the project. And in a lot of ways that crowdsourcing of readiness is what allows these open source projects to really, um, I think, go from being replications of commercial products to actually being the thing that drives commercial products, which I, I would argue we've made that flip. Open core is like the, the, the default now, not the, not the exception. Um, and so we think about anything you know, our value is the service and the user experience, not sort of speeds and feeds, if you will. And um, and so in that respect, we are very clear and thoughtful about like what goes upstream into the open source project. And it's basically core functionality that does not, that we think sort of the entire community benefits from um, and isn't sort of differentiated to us, you know? And I think you do need to be thoughtful about where that line is. Um, and not trying to build your product through the open source community. Like you're not going to get 80 people who do you do your job for free, right? I don't think that that is the value of open source. I think it's really about this like readiness and production burn in and, and mind share. You know, when people ask us, you know, prove to me that you scale, we say, well, we're based on Apache Flink and they go, okay. And they move right on to the next question. Right, because they understand what Apache Flink means in terms of scalability and robustness and those kinds of things. That's valuable to us and to the community. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but like that's how we think about it. <laughs> Let's just uh, switch the gear and talk a bit about once again, or not switch, you stay on the commercial side. You folks uh, have announced a partnership with Data Stacks. Talk a bit about the scope of this partnership. This was a really easy decision, I think, for, for us. You know, Chet Kapoor over at, over at DataSax and I sort of had this conversation where they have this super robust uh, streaming platform that is based on Apache Pulsar. They, uh, they haven't built out like a robust processing layer. And we, uh, you know, serendipitously don't view ourselves as providing the, the streaming layer that we, we really focus on the processing capabilities. And so when Chet and I talked about this, um, their CEO over there, you know, this was just like, we didn't have to spend a whole t a lot of time thinking about, you know, what, what's the story here? Why is this interesting? It was just obvious, you know, we can, you know, for us, uh, selfishly, DataStax has an amazing um, business with, uh, you know, Apache Cassandra and now Apache Pulsar and the commercial versions of that with like Astra DB and Astra Streaming and, and, and the Luna equivalent, which is their on-prem version. And, um, and so we get to tap into that community of people who already um, are, are using these systems and just need some additional processing capabilities. And, you know, I think for them, it means that they can offer probably a more complete system. I don't want to speak for them, but they can probably offer a more complete solution. And, um, and, and that to me was just like super obvious and really exciting, you know? Um, so it's opened up the ability to go talk to people who are already using uh, things like uh, Apache Cassandra in production at scale, who now want to do things like pull a change data capture stream off of the database and then process what's happening in real time. And they can do that 
without, you know, months and months of engineering effort and without switching vendors and like all these other kinds of things. It's a very nice jigsaw puzzle fit between the, the, between the two of us. Excuse me. So we have a nice combined solution between Astro Streaming, Astro DB, and Decodable um, that I like to think about as like full stack real time, if, that, if that's a phrase. And, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to build out what the go-to-market side of that is. I think we probably have a, a better understanding of the, the product and engineering integration. We're now sort of, you know, knee deep and sort of figuring out how do we help customers understand that value and, um, and finding like sort of the most critical use cases. I think we know what that looks like, um, but we're seeing more and more of that. So that's, that's just really exciting. If you look at a lot of emerging use cases, you know, we can also talk about EVs because EVs will also be consuming a lot of, you know, they will need a lot of real time, you know, analytics data. Plus, we also talk about edge computing where uh, things are like that you don't send it. So if you look at some of these also uh, with the Apple's announcements, you know, things are moving more and more towards, you know, you can call that edge or IoT. So edge can also be a data center. It could be a small, smart device as well. Cars are coming in. Things are getting smarter. What kind of trends you are seeing towards the, the real-time data that you see and you say, hey, this is what we are seeing. And because of the trend, sometimes it brings a lot of opportunity for the company, but it also creates a lot of massive challenges. So so, so what, what do you see there? You know, let's, I mean, we should not, COVID had taught us not talk about five or 10 years, but, uh, you know, looking at these trends, uh, what kind of future you see for real-time uh, or streaming data? Yeah, I think, you know, the like I said, I think the big macro barrier to streaming becoming the default way that we process data is the complexity and the skill gap. And so I think the trend will be about, and we, we see this already, like, you know, for, for a while we swam away from as an industry, things like SQL. And then we realized the reasons why we liked SQL is, you know, everybody knew it. And so you see this trend of like more and more of these systems uh, meeting the user where they are. And that means, you know, running in the languages, you know, that they, that they're already familiar with. I think that's probably a non-controversial uh, uh, trend that we're seeing. Um, but I think the, uh, I think the other thing that we're seeing is the analytics systems, the operational side of the house has always been real time, right? Like the, the OLTP, you know, databases and event-driven microservices, you know, the last 10 years or so, like all of that's always kind of been real time. The analytics side of the data stack is actually what is starting to also go real time. So we're seeing more and more of these purpose-built low latency database systems like imply with apache druid or starchy with apache pino um, or Rockset, um you know and and even full-on streaming database systems like materialize and, and those kinds of things and so i think you know i think that that is an interesting trend i think that databricks has started to do this with delta live tables and snowflake has started to build more streaming capabilities into the database and so i think that the, the analytics out of the house is basically like slowly transitioning its way over to real time. Um, I do think that there's this question about is, like, who is the persona? Is it, cause I mean, a lot of this stuff breaks down into, you know, basically the, the SQL camp and the Python camp. And one is basically geared at, you know, analysts and maybe business users and certainly engineers being SQL. And then, you know, uh, Python is, is very clear, clearly like data science and, and, and developers. Um, I don't know how that plays out over time. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I'm probably not the right person to think about sort of like edge compute. It's just not my forte. But I do, we are seeing more and more of this with like everything from Cloudflare workers, you know, to like you said, processing on devices and stuff like that. So I, I think if anything, it's only going to get more real time and more complicated. That's for, that's for sure. It's only getting worse. You know, I don't know that it's getting better. <laughs>
um, in terms of like the sophistication of the use cases and the technology. Does that make sense? Eric, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, Decodable. Uh, I really love, you know, the way you talked about the whole uh, evolution of open source and you know, the commercialization of open source. And of course, uh, where real time streaming data is heading. And as I said, you know, this is a topic that we can sit down and uh, talk for hours. So let's split those hours in multiple sessions and let's have you back on the show in the future. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.